Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 266 of Humanity Rising. Today, we're going to delve into President Joe Biden's foreign policy, military policy, nuclear policy. And as it turns out, uh, the president left today uh, for Europe, uh, where he's going to attend the G7. Uh, he's going to have a summit with Vladimir Putin. Uh, he's going to be talking to, with uh, principally European uh, and international leaders about uh, his plans and his aspirations for a realignment uh, between the United States and the NATO alliance and the major international institutions that were uh, so uh, deeply degraded uh, by former President uh, Donald Trump. Uh, so today, we want to just delve into the geostrategic framing for international relations, uh, which uh, have been uh, built uh, since uh, 1648 and the w Treaty of Westphalia uh, that ended the Hundred Years' War in Europe and began the, the era of nation states uh, that endures uh, to the present day. But before we uh, delve into these matters, uh, let us take a pause as we always do on Humanity Rising. Take a few deep breaths, center yourself in your body, close your eyes and attune yourself with your heart. Listen to your heartbeat in a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving that you're alive we're all alive at this most extraordinary moment in the human journey. Thank you, everyone. And now with an open heart and a heart full of gratitude for each and every one of you who are joining our session today, I want to commence our program by recalling uh, the theme of yesterday, uh, which was on the shape of peace and how people around the world envision peace and how the aspirational imagination of proactive peace and harmony between humanity and between humanity uh, and the larger ecosystem of planet Earth uh, can fill us with hope, joy, and a trust that somehow in some mysterious way, uh, the spirit that guides the affairs of all of life will weave what we do and what we believe and what we yearn for together into a tapestry that can redeem. Today, we want to focus on the other side of that coin. We want to look at some of the challenges, the strategic, the tactical, the political, 
uh, challenges uh, for a country like the United States, uh, the most massively powerful nation uh, in the history of the world, who has aggregated um, military bases that encompass the planet, uh, that has a system of space weaponry and satellites that can uh, do unimaginable damage, that has a nuclear arsenal uh, that can destroy the world many times over, that has a biochemical arsenal uh, with equal uh, damage and destructive power. 4% uh, of the human population uh, consuming 25% of the human resources uh, has contributed more than any other country to climate change. Uh, and yet, paradoxically, because of the Constitution uh, written uh, 243 years ago, uh, the United States also stands tattered because of our behavior, but nevertheless, as an illumination for what democracy can be. So today we wanna to look at President Biden's foreign and military and nuclear policy. And to guide us in that endeavor, we wanna welcome back Cynthia Lazarov. You all know her. Uh, she's been a stalwart in the, in the um, environmental and nuclear movements uh, for many, many decades. Uh, she convened our panels on the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki last year. Uh, and has uh, been uh, present on other panels with Vladimir Posner as we discuss uh, the politics and history and personality of, of the leader of Russia. Uh, and today she's convening our panel on President Biden's foreign policy. So Cynthia, welcome and thank you so much for all you've done to illuminate our community on some of the complexities of military and uh, nuclear policy. Thank you, Jim. It's really an honor to be back with you and everyone today at Humanity Rising. And I'm really honored to be here. It's an especially honored because we have really a wonderful and I would say extraordinary and, and brilliant group of panelists with us to talk about Biden's foreign policy today. Christine Ahn, Joe Cirincioni, and Katrina Vanden Heuvel. And so I just wanna open by saying at a time when our US for, former Secretary of Defense, William Perry says that we're at a greater risk of a nuclear catastrophe than even during the Cold War, the Biden administration has just proposed a $752.9 billion defense budget, which is an increase from the Trump years. And also President Biden seems thus far committed to proceeding with the estimated $1.5 trillion modernization of our nuclear arsenal over the next 15 years, which many of the top experts believe will actually increase the risk of a nuclear confrontation. So all of this in the context and in the face of the existential threats of climate change, the pandemic, and so many other urgent domestic and global problems that are desperately requiring resources to pay for them. So I really can't think of anybody better than Christine, Joe, and Katrina to navigate this for us, to shed light on what this all really means, um, what's at stake for the United States, for the world, for the people around the world, and what must be done truly to advance peace and to secure our future. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And if you panelists want to turn on your videos now. Um, I want to say that if they look familiar to you as they appear on the screen, it's probably because you've seen them on television. They all appear regularly as expert commentators on media outlets ranging from CNN to PBS to MSNBC and many, many more. So um, I'd like to start by introducing you, Christine. Christine on Welcome is the founder and executive director of Women Cross DMZ, a global movement of women mobilizing to end the Korean War and ensure women's leadership in peace building. In 2015, she led 30 international women 
peacemakers across the DMZ from North Korea to South Korea. They walked with 10,000 Korean women on both sides of the DMZ and held women's peace symposia in Pyongyang and Seoul. She's the recipient of the 2020 US Peace Prize for her bold activism to end the Korean War, heal the wounds from the war and for women's leadership in peace building. I just wanna say personally that Christine, I met you just over a year ago and you are a huge inspiration for me in my work with women and for so many of us truly every day. Um, you're a courageous light and force for peace. So thank you for all you do and welcome to be with us. So next I'd like to welcome you, Joe. Um, Joe is a distinguished, Joe Cirincioni is a distinguished fellow at the Quincy Institute a national security analyst and author of many books, including Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It's Too Late, and Bomb Scare, The History and Future of Nuclear Weapons, as well as over 800 articles and reports on defense and national security. Previously, Joe served as president of the Plowshares Fund, among other positions, including nine years on the professional staff of the Arms Services Committee. Joe, I just met you in April, but I've long admired you. You have dedicated decades of your life to eliminating weapons of mass destruction, to sounding the alarm on out of control defense spending, to waking people up to nuclear dangers and the unacceptably high risk of the unthinkable nuclear war. So thank you for all you do, Joe, and welcome to join us today. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, Katrina, I'd like to come to you next. So Katrina is editorial director and publisher of The Nation and served as editor from 1995 to 2019. She's been a leading voice on all progressive issues for decades and writes a weekly column for the Washington Post. Katrina is also the author of several books, including The Change I Believe In, Fighting for Progress in the Age of Obama. She has been recognized and awarded for her journalism and public service by numerous organization and, organizations and serves on many boards including the American Co Committee for US-Russia Accord. Katrina, truly, I'm in awe of all you do. I don't know how you do it. And especially grateful for all you've given over so many decades to US-Soviet and now US-Russia relations, contributing your eloquent voice to catalyzing a national conversation on the imperative need to restore dialogue, dignity, humanity, and sanity to US-Russia relations. Thank you for all you do. And so welcome, Katrina, as well. So I wanna start by um, asking the question to each of the panelists. Uh, over the past decade, we've seen an increasing militarization of US foreign policy, a dangerous decline in dialogue and diplomacy, and this is continuing with the Biden administration today. So what's really at stake for the United States, for the world, for the people? And at a time when the risk of a nuclear catastrophe is escalating and tensions are escalating with nuclear adversaries, Russia, China and North Korea, what are you most concerned about? What keeps you awake at night? How concerned are you that the unthinkable could happen, that nuclear weapons could be used for the first time since Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And Joe, I'd like to start with you and invite you to give us really the big picture here of the militarization of US foreign policy, the stakes and overall nuclear risk. And, and, and I'd like you to include the, if you can, the, um, the new Cold War with China and what impact this is having on, on the nuclear risk. Welcome. Let me do that in hopefully a few minutes and, and it'll be a necessarily thin, but let's take a look at this. I think it's important to understand that we are still suffering from the intense militarization of US foreign policy that began with the 9-11 attacks uh, over almost 20 years ago um, when when George W. Bush, the then president, before that, those September 11th attacks, we had a Pentagon budget that was about 300, million, $300 billion. We still had the largest military in the world. We were spending more than any other country, more than the next 10 countries combined. We were a massive military presence, but we were doing that about for about $300 billion. As you said, Cynthia, Joe Biden's budget is now for $753 billion. So you can see the growth of the military budget, the Pentagon budget over those, those 20 years. And that was all the result of two things. One, the 9-11 attack, which shocked the nation and brought an immediate 
public consensus that we had to take military action against those who attacked us. But then the, 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 the unprecedented neoconservative experiment that used that 9-11 attack to then launch the invasion of Iraq and then to and the continuous occupation of Afghanistan in pursuit of this idea that we could secure U.S. geostrategic interests by military means primarily, that the military was the chief instrument of U.S. foreign policy. We've seen the results of that, the trillions of dollars, some estimate seven, seven trillion dollars spent on the those forever wars, uh, tens of U.S. service personnel giving their lives, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, Afghanis, and others in the region killed as a result of these wars, and chaos in the Middle East, much less secure in the Middle East than we were 20 years ago, and the growth of the Pentagon budget. You've seen this grow so that almost every program was justified in some way as a fight against um, uh, the global war on terrorism. And now, as the global war on terrorism starts to recede, as Joe Biden is continuing the task of withdrawing from those regions, and to his credit, has now uh, decided that we're going to get have zero military presence in Afghanistan by the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, we see the, the, the threat that justifies this enormous military budget shifting from uh, the global war on terrorism to China, so that everything is justified by the rising threat of China, even though the United States spends three times as much on our military as China does, even though the United States, with its allies, account for three quarters of global spending on, on the military. So three quarters of everything that's spent in the world is spent by the United States and its allies on, uh, on military equipment. So you go, what's, what's going on here? Why is this so out of whack? In, in my view, you can always look at the national security debate and see three different factors, ideology, politics, and money, or corporate profits. And you can see it, they're always present, and it's a question of which one dominates. You could say, for example, that during the Reagan administration, uh, ideology dominated. That's what drove the Reagan build up. You could argue that when Barack Obama was trying to pay modest arms uh, 10 years ago in, in, in 2010, that it was politics that dominated, but Mitch McConnell determined not to give a Democratic president uh, a foreign policy victory. Right now, I think what explains the size of the U.S. military budget, and particularly the nuclear budget, is corporate profits that these corporations have grown so much over the last 20 years, have just embedded themselves in the Pentagon so much that everything from the initial military requirements to the, the statements that uh, generals read before Senate hearing have, have a contractor role in them, a consulting role in them. And that the jobs that these contracts provide the, the, uh, are, are the m primary motivation for many senators, many members of Congress to support these contracts, to support these budget. And of course, there's the campaign contributions that, that uh, are a big factor in a politician's decision. So right now, I would say that the strategic debate, why we need to do this, what the rationale is for, for doing this, is, is, is a veneer, a thin veneer on this um, engine of corporate profits that, are, that, have, do that have seized control of military policy in the United States and are driving the debate forward. So what does Joe Biden do? His will all close. Why does he support this high level of spending? Well, the basic reason is, is political. He doesn't think that we need all that, but he's got a full domestic agenda. He has mountains to move domestically. And he needs, he's got, as he said, he has a Senate that's tied and a House with dem Democratic majority by a very thin majority. So he, he can't afford to do anything that upsets democratic vote domestic agenda, and that includes not cutting military contracts that would upset state delegations, not cutting a new ICBM program that's going to cost us $100 billion because it might upset, for example, John Tester, a vote he needs from the state of Montana, where we have an ICBM base. So he and he wants to be seen as a, as a strong on national security, doesn't want anything to undermine that view. So it's politics that are driving his military budget, while you're seeing essentially the continuation of the Trump military 
a buildup under Joe Biden, why you see his general posture towards the world as being a continuation of this militarization that we've seen over the last 20 years. Is this going to change? Uh, that'll be up to us. It'll be up to what the public does to change that. But the internal dynamics are going to continue to drive the Biden presidency in this direction. Joe, thanks for providing that context going back to 9-11 and giving us that sweep to, to show us how we've gotten to where we are today and, and what's at stake and what the real heart of the matter is, which is the corporate profit today, and that it's really up to us. Um, before we go on to, um, to the other panelists, can you just speak for a minute about the nuclear risk and your concern about it today. Um, I know it was a big question with a lot of pieces, but I'd love to hear you, your comments since you've spent so much time sounding the alarm on this, what you see that, how you see that today in terms of the risk and what, what, what are you most concerned about? Sure, so why does Bill Perry say that we're even at greater risk today than we were, for example, during the Cold War, where we were at tremendous risk? <laughs> this was not trivial. And he's saying it's even more now. And the primary reason, I think, is because the U.S. nuclear forces and the Russian, the U.S. and Russia account for about 80, about 93 percent of all the weapons in the world are held by the United States and Russia. So when you talk about global stockpiles, you're really talking about two countries with the other seven countries, you know, numbering their arsenals in, in tens and dozens. Um, and these po these postures remain on a Cold War footing, meaning that they, they maintain very high levels of alert for their nuclear weapons, that they, the US in particular has a first strike policy. So we'd be willing to use nuclear weapons first in a conflict, even a conventional conflict. Under Trump uh, we, and unchanged by Biden so far, we gave nuclear uh, weapons more missions. So not reducing their role, but giving them more missions to counter a conventional attack, a chemical attack, even a cyber attack according to the Trump policy, which is still governing US posture. And then you have this very increasingly complicated issue of warning time. How do you know if you're being attacked? And this is what worries Bill Perry the most. And I agree with him that, there, that the, the, the combination of new technologies, stealth, uh, faster speeds from many of, of these weapons, uh, smaller delivery vehicles for these weapons, mean that your warning time is decreased. And then you add this factor of cyber, which is a new factor that we're now increasingly taking into account, where we have the ability, where a, a, a cyber attack on the United States control system could either uh, make it so that if the president pushed the button, figuratively, pushed the button, nothing would happen. Or when the president didn't push the button, something happened. Or a third party could hack into our system. The Nuclear Threat Initiative did a study on this several years ago that said that warned that you could spoof an attack. You could make the United States or Russia, whose system is even more vulnerable now, think they were being under attack when they weren't. And so that risk of miscalculation, uh, accident, or as we just got from the saw the Trump presidency, madness, are factors that are uh, that are at, that are increased. Oh, in, in the current period, and that make the risk of a, a blundering into a nuclear war by miscalculation, by accident, by madness, greater now than they were during most periods of the Cold War. So yes, even though you're not thinking about nuclear weapons, they're thinking about you, and they're still there. Joe, that was really great. And just to, to really giving us very quickly an overview of the multiplicity of factors that complicate the nuclear risk today, which is why we're at such a greater risk. And that um, even though I love it, that even though we're not thinking about nuclear weapons, although you and I are, they're thinking about us. So thank you so much for that. And so I'd like to move to you now, um, Katrina, and again, welcome you and, and ask you for your insight and wisdom on this question. And in particular, I'd like for you to address the new Cold War with Russia and what the stakes are there and what you're, what you're most concerned about today. Um, thank you for including me, Joe. That was a terrifying conclusion. Uh, thank you for giving us an early alert warning, not so early. My friend, Eric Schlosser wrote a book I recommend to people 
command and control because I think it's the miscalculation. And to paraphrase William Perry, it's blundering into uh, a nuclear exchange that has uh, been so terrifying. I want to suggest just a few thoughts, some of this riffing off of Joe. Um, it seems to me it's a, it's a very important time and one we should seize. It reminds me of after World War II, after the first Cold War, and now the reckoning with a, dare I say, post-COVID world, a world that has reminded us of the futility of weapons in the face of pandemic. Um, it seems to me we need new thinking, not new weapons. And new thinking harks back to someone I admire who is still with us at 90, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, who in a speech at the UN in 1988, spoke about a, a kind of new thinking and it engaged nuclear weapons very clearly and the futility then of nuclear weapons, which is more clear today. I think uh, he spoke also and others have in these last years of human security, another way to measure security. The idea of tackling the crises of our time, climate, global inequality, poverty, uh, and nuclear proliferation uh, as opposed to nuclear escalation. Um, I differ with Joe in a, a sense in the, that I think um, we need to look back to the first Cold War, even the end of World War II, because it was then that the mindset of this country was so established as one of triumphalism, of uh, supremacy uh, and exceptionalism, which I think still drives our policies. Um, it was a lost opportunity at the end of the first Cold War when, as Jack Matlock, the ambassador said, no one won the Cold War. And I think that is worth remembering as is the statement that Gorbachev Reagan ended 1985 in Geneva with, which is, you know, nuclear war cannot be won, should not be fought. If Biden and Putin could come out of the summit next week, reaffirming that it would be a step forward, even if they don't go through the concrete measures that Joe spoke of, which are teed up to be uh, past trigger for take it off uh, hair trigger first use we've talked about the money it's interesting because i had a chance to uh moderate a bulletin of atomic science uh scientists uh seminar about an article on the new icbms and part of the problem is goes back again to world war ii we have military keynesianism so that a lot of the jobs in this country rely or even economic development in parts of this country rely on a military budget. So there is a new wave in Congress of new representatives who speak about different approaches to foreign affairs. There's a new cut the defense budget caucus, but it is weak compared to what is called the missile caucus because the missile caucus has the power, has the corporations, as Joe said, has you know weight and economic development and jobs. So we need to retrieve, if your audience doesn't remember Seymour Melman, a kind of conversion, just transition project, because I think that would help. Um, I also think you know, what, what has been shown in these last years and should have been shown more clearly before is we do better getting our own house in order before we go out and preach, which doesn't mean we don't engage in dialogue with Russia, which by the way is cr more crucial than ever. I don't know if people know that the consulates uh, in the United States, Russian consulates, US consulates in Russia have been closed. The US embassy is not giving Russian visas for travel. As ambassador Matlock said, he spent much of his time as ambassador trying to work access for Russians to come here and exchange ideas. And now this is shut down for the moment. This is so counterproductive as is the shutdown of exchanges. We should escalate exchanges, not weapons. We should, so in that sense, it seems you know, very important to think about that. And as I've talked to Cynthia about quite a bit, you know, I reported on Russia, Moscow for 40 years. I was there in 1978. I've worked with independent groups, with journalists, with feminist groups, um, nonprofits, NGOs. And when there is a cold war, the space for dissent closes. War parties are empowered on both sides. Uh, the money goes to fill the weapons coffers, fuels nationalist fervor. We see it in our country too. And it becomes more difficult to exchange, engage in a dialogue. I think to some extent in the last few years about Russia, diplomacy has almost been criminalized 
And I think we need to retrieve diplomacy and dialogue as common sense, basic uh, metrics. I will, you know, I'll stop. Um, Joe raised this question the other day. And I think it's a very important question. How is it that at a time when Biden's agenda is surprisingly progressive, ambitious, that the administration still seems stuck in largely obsolete play modes? I mean, the Afghanistan withdrawal is important, but the idea of endless war is not fully off the agenda, nor is the idea of uh, the indispensable nation. And I think until there's a new, really new thinking, not just signing on to the Paris Climate Accord, which is important, but new thinking about militarization and how military misadventures abroad don't permit true democracy at home, uh, an important through line in our history, and that there aren't new people. I, I mean, people are not everything, but personnel is important. And I do think, um, you know, with all due respect, the people are of a different era in a way, their mindset. And there are certain people who might be included in the administration. So at least it's a, you know, ideas, different ideas. You do have a bench of younger domestic policy people, but Joe yeah. may disagree, but I don't see this administration being inclusive or welcoming to a range of people who might be called more realist, not, you know, of the liberal interventionist school, certainly the neocons with the exception of Victoria Newland, have not been brought into this administration. But you do need new thinking and new thinking often comes from new schools of thought, new groupings of people. So um, I will stop there. Um, the one other thing I would say is that journalism is important. Uh, the media defines reality for many people. Uh, Cynthia knows much about this. But we do have a media which doesn't seem to, don't, doesn't need to be left right, but needs to understand the danger of nuclear weapons, needs to read budgets. If you know, you're gonna say budget or budgets are a measure of our values, let's have some real contextual uh, national reporting and not just specialist reporting like a Bill Hartong or Joe, but we need reporters who give some history, some context, uh, some sense of urgency even at times. And I think too often our media is like day one. And maybe the summit in Geneva will inspire some coverage of history because the Reagan Gorbachev summit, summit was so colorful, so to speak, that that might engage. Uh, but so I end just with new thinking. We need new thinking. And I think it's a time where um, it's possible because our country, the world has been so ravaged and uh, kind of opened up by pandemic to possibility. So time of possibility and peril. Thank you. Katrina, you've given us a lot to think about um, there. And I just wanna reflect back to you. We need new thinking, not new weapons. That's mm -hmm. very simple, but very profound. And this idea of collective security that Gorbachev raised when there was that possibility yeah. We all thought everything was possible near the end of the Cold War. And how do we get back to that, which we'll come back to later? I think it's really important. And this idea of we have to get beyond this idea of triumphalism, that we're the winners, that we won the Cold War. We, and this idea of American exceptionalism, this idea that we're going to bring America back to be great again. What does that mean? You know, what does that mean? So um, and how, how damaging has that been? and can be again. So thank you for that. So dear Christine, coming to you next, and I really would like you with especially all of your dedication to the Korean Peninsula and peace there and denuclearization to, to talk to us about what you see in terms of Biden's foreign policy with respect to that place that is um, often on the brink of conflict and, and worries many of us. So please, we welcome you to share your wisdom. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And um, I just really feel honored to be on this panel with everyone. Um, I've been on many shows with Joe and I've always appreciated his kind of activist spirit. Um, and Katrina, your comments today are just so profound. And I just, and Cynthia, you know how much I love you. So I just feel so honored to be sharing space with you all. Um, first, I, before I even begin my remarks, I just wanna echo what Katrina said about um, 
I mean, even going far further back, which I'll address later about um, the context of anti-Asian violence and the long history of U.S. gunboat diplomacy. It's always been a westward, you know, I think in the whole history of the U.S., it's always been westward, west or westward, but it's really eastward, right, towards Asia and the Pacific. Um, and in fact, it was the Korean War after World War II, right, that um, inaugurated the military industrial complex. In those three years, 1950 to 53, the U.S. quadrupled defense spending. It set forth the U.S. to become the world's military police. And in fact, the Korean War was the first U.S. Sino War, um, China got involved in the Korean War. So I think we have a lot to learn about the Korean War and how important ending the Korean War is to shifting, radically shifting US militarized foreign policy. So um, your question was like, what keeps me up at night? And what's, you know, and I just like, I hearken back to remember the fire and fury era in 2017, we almost went to war with North Korea. And at that time I'm here in Honolulu, I attended this like um, DOD, um, session at a church in my neighborhood. And um, they were giving advice on how to prepare for a nuclear attack. I mean, I honestly felt like I was in the twilight zone. I, I stood up and I was like, um, we can't prepare for a nuclear attack. You can't tell me how much water and food I need to prepare um, in the event of a missile attack carrying a nuclear weapon from North Korea. And everybody looked at me like I was nuts. I was like, we need our leaders to talk to North Korea. And we were just in that crazy um, time where uh, everyone was just completely freaking out. And then of course that led to that false missile alert here in Hawaii. So I just feel like we're starting to enter that period. We are gearing towards going to war with China. I'm worried that the Biden administration won't make progress with North Korea and that the nuclear crisis will just get worse. I'm worried about the Korean families that are still divided by the war, many in their 70s and 80s and 90s that they won't see their loved ones before they pass. And I fear that what we're seeing right now against Asian Americans is just the beginning of what Arab and Muslim communities faced in the aftermath of 9-11. So, as far as US policy and the Biden administration's approach to North Korea, first, let me just say it's important to take a step back, the historical perspective that Katrina says we need. The, the North Korea nuclear crisis did not begin with North Korea. It actually is the unresolved Korean War. Um, the US is the one that threatened to use nuclear weapons during the Korean War. And the US is the one that first introduced weapons onto the Korean Peninsula um, in violation of the Armistice Agreement and kept them there until George Bush Sr. So in the US, the Korean War is called the Forgotten War, uh, despite the fact that 4 million people were killed between 1950 and 53. This is a war that only ended with a ceasefire, which is why the Korean War and not the war in Afghanistan is actually the US's longest overseas conflict. So what are the consequences of this forever war? Well, the US and North Korea, we, we saw in 2017 and 18, that came dangerously close to renewed military conflict. Uh, the Congressional Research Service estimates that in the opening days of a military conflict, 300,000 people would be killed. We have about 30,000 troops on 87 bases in South Korea. Um, if nuclear weapons were used, up to 25 million people would be impacted. So this is no joke. Um, you know, they have uh, weapons pointed at each other at any moment, and we could blunder into war with North Korea. And North Korea is estimated to possess between 20 to 60 nuclear weapons, despite being one of the most sanctioned countries in the world. So for decades, the past US administrations have tried to pressure North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons, sanctions, political isolation, military threats, and it hasn't worked. And it's only exacerbated the problem. So that's why Women Cross DMZ, that's why we did our bold action in 2015. That's why we continue to call for a peace agreement to end the Korean War. We believe that to convince somebody to put down a gun, you first have to convince them that they will not be harmed. And so we need to address the root cause of the conflict, the unresolved Korean War, and establish a peace first approach to create the necessary conditions for denuclearization. That's why the 
a security guarantee in the foreign peace agreement must come at the beginning, not at the end. And so we're not the only ones calling for this. In 2018, the leaders of North and South Korea, they signed something called the Panmunjom Jum Declaration, where they committed to transforming Korea to be a land of peace away from war. And, um, you know, the problem is like what both Joe and Katrina are talking about is like, you know, this mindset that peace is rewarding bad behavior. And um, this, these are the same talking heads on all these like airtime major news networks. You know, they advocate for more pressure, more sanctions, more military threats. And these have totally failed. And so right now the Biden administration, they have come out with a North Korea policy review. We still don't know what that it entails. Um, but we know that the policy on Korea is going to be a part of a larger national security strategy where the primary aim, as Joe says, is to contain the rise of China. In his book, The Pivot, Kirk Campbell, the White House Asia czar, says Washington schools in Asia have always been, quote, selling shirts, saving souls, and spreading liberal ideas, end quote. Asia is a research resource-rich region with vast opportunities for market expansion, and Washington sees Beijing's rise as a direct threat to its national security interests. And so the Biden team's top foreign policy goal is to get ahead of China to shape the region according to its own interests by writing the rules that govern the region's economic and political activities. So I'm going to close by saying that, um, you know, in terms of Korea, the Biden administration, there was a recent summit between Moon and Biden. It was so much about the U.S. ROK alliance, which is a militarized alliance, not about the people or democracy. Um, and they're trying, the Biden administration is trying to get South Korea to join the trilateral alliance with Japan, which is very sticky because Korea was colonized by Japan for 35 years and still like lots of outstanding issues need to be resolved including the issue of the comfort women, um, over 200,000 Korean women that were forced into um, sexual slavery by the Japanese military. Um, or they're trying to force South Korea to join the Quad, which is the India, Australia, Japan, and US um, coalition. And you know, it's gonna continue to rely on the same approach of sanctions, uh, using human rights to further like vilify North Korea and putting the responsibility of the stalemate on North Korea. I, that's what I see happening. And that really concerns me because that is um, that is perpetuating the Obama strategic patience, that is perpetuating Trump's failed maximum pressure policy. And we have to look at it in terms of the reverberating effects because it's just cementing Cold War divisions it's triggering an arms race that risks military confrontation. The US has 300 bases encircling China. We don't ever hear that reality. And increased naval presence and arms sales in Asia have provoked China to increase its defense budget. And now China's militarization is then triggering Japan to further strengthen its military capability, which is then provoking South Korea. It is this deadly, deadly domino effect. And we have desperately to come up with a new approach and shift U.S. foreign policy away from being a dominating one to um, one that is based on cooperation and co coexistence, peaceful coexistence. Christine, that was really um, a journey that you've taken us on. And I, you know, most people don't realize that we're still at war with North Korea, uh, with Korea, that, 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 that war has not ended and um, that it is the forgotten war, as you say. And it's so important to understand as we step into the shoes of people on the Korean Peninsula that until there is peace, there is no way that denuclearization is even a possibility. So to continue to perpetuate this idea that denuclearization should come first and then the reward is peace, that that's all backwards, that you've just really illuminated that. And then the historical context, um, which I know you'll get into more, is just devastating. And to hear that there are, I think you said 87 bases just in South Korea, US bases, 87 US bases in one that one country. And you said 300 is around China. How many did you say? Encircling 300 US bases, 800 US bases around the world in 80 countries. That is 
insane. <laughs> it's just so to really give us that that perspective has been really helpful as we as we move into this conversation. Thank you so much. Um, so my, my next follow up question to each of you is what three steps should the Biden would you recommend the Biden administration take to back us away from the brink to move us towards sanity? And I'm going to start come back to you, Joe, to start on that. Well, I want to pick up on something that Katrina said about the people that Biden has in his office. And she's absolutely right. He's basically brought in establishment Democrats, rather centrist forces, some from the um, Warren camp, for example, Sasha Baker, who's over the National Security Council, but none from the Sanders camp. So the very first step is to remember that that people are policy. So bring in other points of view into DOD you know, into the State Department, into the National Security Council. So you have this diversity of opinions that will guarantee you have a, a, a better policy. The second thing I, I would say, he's, he's got to take a very, he's got to take a knife to the, the budget. It, since it's my view that it's profits, it's contracts that are driving this policy, you've got to reduce those incentives. You've got to reduce the, those, the, the money that's flowing through the system. And he obviously didn't do it with this year's budget. We've got, a, there's some pressure in the house to, to, to cut the budget, but it's gonna fail this year. That, he's got another shot next budget. And then the, the third thing I would do is again, picking up on what Katrina did, is emphasize the role of dialogue in his national security policy. Why is he talking to Putin? You know, this is not a gift to Putin. This is not because he's weak. It's because this is how the United States conducts policy. We talk to uh, leaders of other countries, especially our adversaries. So more dialogue with the people we consider our adversaries, searching for ways to cooperate, even as we contend. That would be my three recommendations. Thank you, Joe. That's really the, the, the theme of the need for dialogue and diplomacy is a recurring theme in this conversation. And all your recommendations are really really important for us to think about. Thank you. Um, Katrina. I'm going to cheat because I'm always bad at three things. I'm just going to say people should look up, you know, go to William Perry and Tom Colina's latest book because they have a list of 10 steps, which I'll make by one item uh, in terms of hair trigger alert and, you know, a, a, um, hair trigger, no first uh, use and a step series of steps that I think would address what Joe spoke of and Christine, which is the, mis the blundering, the accidental, the miscalculation. I think that's the real danger. Um, people are policy, I, I couldn't agree more. And I would add to that, I think the American people are part of this equation in the sense, I will never speak for the American people, but I do think um, there's a disconnect, not only between the domestic and the foreign policy, but number two, it's a disconnect between what happens inside the beltway often around these foreign policy issues and the country. I think if I could speak, I mean, you could see in 2016 that the three states, the 60 counties where they were most killed and maimed in endless war, Afghanistan, Iraq, voted for Trump because Trump cynically spoke of ending endless war. He did not follow through, but I think there's an exhaustion in the country and it's not isolationism, it's simply seeking a different engagement with the world. So that's two. And then Christine spoke of alliances. I think if we could demilitarize some of our alliances, again, I come back to NATO, for example, if there could at least be a promise NATO wouldn't expand, there's no, I did, no reality, I think, in terms of coming back to what was the hope, which was a common European home, not NATO post reunification of Germany, but no expansion of NATO and understanding the country as it is, and Tom and William Perry's uh, good list. And the last, if I get a fourth, we should have a Department of Peace in the department. It used to be called the Department of War. And there is a difference between national defense and national security, so to speak. But I think there are proposals. And if eminent establishment people can propose the abolition of nuclear weapons, I think a Department of Peace would restore luster to that term, which has been, uh, Mis, you know, often misunderstood as weakness. Anyway, sorry, I'm bad at the. 
No, no, that was great. Uh, the Perry Kalina book is the button. And I think, I think it's a great recommendation for how we, those 10 steps would back us away from the brink. And um, I love the Department of Peace and, you know, reminding us of the risk of accidental nuclear war and, and the blundering. That's, that's the big challenge for us today. So, um, and something we all need to be awake to and worried about to do something about. Um, Christine, your recommendations welcome you. Well, I have to stick with the Korea for number one, we have to end the Korean war and we have to negotiate a peace agreement with North Korea, which I think will play a significant role in allowing the Korean peninsula, North and South Korea and the people of the Korean peninsula to become a, an independent, hopefully reunified and non-aligned. Um, and that could really neutralize the great power competition between the US and China. I think that could be a real game changer for the region. Um, number two, we have to cut in, 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 in addition to the Pentagon budget, we have to, and critical I think to that would be closing down the US military bases around the world, the 800 military bases. Um, I think that there is this um, false notion that the US bases are kind of benign that they're just there, they're just these like military apparatuses. But my experience being in South Korea, going to these places where the US base, I mean, uh, Pyeongtaek, which is Camp Humphreys, which is 50 miles south of Seoul, is the world's largest military base. They, it's like the size of like three central parks. I mean, it is just insane, the size. And, you know, they're not just there to house the 30,000 troops and their families, but it has become these like mini Americas that is provocative. And it is also the place where all the military exercises are staged, where B-2 bombers take flight and fly perilously close to the border with North Korea. It is, you know, co contrary to this perception that this is what strengthens um, U.S. security and national security. It has the counter effect. It actually further provokes North Korea and causes them to then like test missiles and stuff. So I think we really need to, as part of our um, closing down the US kind of spread of empire around the world, we really do have to close down um, the US military presence around the world. And, and lastly, we have to democratize US foreign policy. I don't, I don't, I can't remember if it was Joe or Katrina, but it's like, you know, um, I remember when I was, uh, briefing the Biden transition team, I heard from the person who now is the State Department spokesperson, Ned Price, he said, yes, well, what Obama did well was um, he listened to domestic groups from a diverse constituency, and we're committed to doing that on U.S. foreign policy. Well, you know, uh, frankly, the Biden administration, and especially the Korea desk of the State Department, has not been very inclusive. They have not been willing to hear from women. They have not been willing to hear from Korean American groups that share a different point of view than their existing paradigm. And I just feel like, um, you know, it, it's not just about the money that we don't have in this country, but it, I, I think that people, especially diasporic communities that see the impact of US militarism in their homelands have an important voice to say, whether it's Iranian Americans, Korean Americans, um, to offer a different kind of way that the United States can act in alliance that is not a militarized alliance um, with the rest of the world. And so I really do feel like um, we have to think about how we set up those mechanisms and processes, but that is gonna be critical if we're gonna have a functioning um, democracy in this country and a, a, a good government. Thanks, Christine. The idea of democratizing foreign policy, I think is important for all of us to think about how we, how we engage and how we make a difference. We're gonna be coming to this as later in the session, but I think that concept and also that you've all alluded to this idea of demilitarizing our alliances to really shifting the paradigm of what an alliance means, that it's cooperation um, and, and peace building rather than war building and war presence. Um, so I, I wanna just touch because we, the next question is, is really um, related to this, this disconnect that we see between the Biden um, foreign policy and domestic policy. And 
I'd love to hear everyone's just thoughts on that and, and what you see as the possibility of breaking through this. What, it, what is at the root of this disconnect? And um, there's such a progressive domestic and ambitious domestic agenda in terms of the environment and, and family care and things like that. But in terms of foreign policy, as a number of you said, we're stuck in this kind of old cold war military um, American exceptionalism idea. So what is, what is this disconnect? Joe, could you, could you, could you start with this, please talk sure. about the root of this? You know, a lot of my best friends are establishment Democrats. I mean, I have, I have discussions with these people. I, I, I knew Tony Blinken when he was a, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I've known Ned Price for a very long time. You know, we know these people, they're good people, but they come from a certain point of view in the Democratic Party that basically ever since Bill Clinton has looked at national security and thought we have to triangulate our national security. That what we, the Democratic Party, really care about is domestic policy. And if we're gonna make, have the political space to do the things we wanna do on domestic policy, and Joe Biden has arguably got the most progressive de Democrat domestic policy of any president ever, perhaps. If we're gonna concentrate on that, we've gotta protect ourselves from the right. So where they've seen national security as a, as, as a wall that wanted to protect themselves from attacks from the right, for being weak on defense, for being appeasers, you know, and even when they do modest, reasonable things, like, for example, get back into the Iran nuclear deal, they get viciously attacked by the Republicans. So they can take some of that heat, a bit of that heat, but they don't want to cut the military budget. They don't want to take a dramatic shift to close the kinds of bases that Christine said we should obviously rationally should do. We do not need all these bases. So that's the way they view it. And it's really hard to argue with that logic politically. I, th I think they're right. Politically, that's a smart move. So what do we have to do? We have to change the equation. We have to be the outside pressure that forces them to respond uh, to what the people of America want and, and have them see that they can't keep doing that. And then in fact, if they change that policy, they'll get rewarded for it, not punished. And so for me, what that means is taking some of the groups that have been in the arms control community or the peace community and have been off here in this niche area, shrinking group and take that and erupted uh, during the Trump years, the women's movement, the Black Lives Matters movement, the climate change movement, where the energy is, where the numbers are, where the money is, we've got to help join with those groups and say that this is a necessary component of, of your agenda. If you want to advance these, your, these domestic issues or these global threats like climate change, you have to cut the military budget. You've got to take the money from there and bring it over here. You have to close these bases because these are an obstacle to what you're doing. And I think Christine really hits on a, a, a key point and sort of a, a, an opening for us, democratize national security policy. It's still made by old white men, old white men. That's who dominates. And, it, it's, and the, the more you can crack that open, it's not that you know, adding Condoleezza Rice to the, to the conversation isn't gonna change the policy, but there are so many more people who think like we do, who are not old white men, that the more you can democratize, the more you can get those, those gender differences, those race differences, and the ideological differences into the mix, the better your chances you have of creating the kind of policy we all wanna see that we think is a safer policy, a better policy for America. If I could jump in, I think um, Joe's absolutely right. I would just mention a few things. One, there has always been a pivot between foreign and domestic policy on the trade issue. On the trade issue, which, you know, Bill Clinton was a neoliberal Democrat and fought hard for NAFTA, fought hard for all the trade agreements, which played a considerable role in not only Bernie Sanders' campaign, but Donald Trump. And I think Biden has reassessed that and has put forward different kinds of trade policies which speak to people, for example, in cities, towns, which have been deindustrialized. De there are obviously complex reasons, but the NAFTA policies have not worked. And I think that's critical and that's a space where you can find sort of accord. Um, the Jamal Bowman is a very interesting representative from New York, from the Bronx, and he, took on and beat Elliot Engel, who I think 
Joe was 16 terms, yes. House Foreign Affairs Committee. And he was a, someone who locked down new thinking about foreign policy. Jamal doesn't have the power yet, but he is speaking in his community about the money that's exiting for weapons that could be brought home. And uh, it's effective. And I think there's a new generation beginning to speak to that about the movements that are in their communities that are militarized and how you make links. The natural link is obviously climate. The climate, you know, nuclear winter, nuclear uh, weapons. And, you know, last night was the 40th anniversary of plowshares or the night before, forgive me. And uh, there was talk about creating coalitions with new movements, not uh, artificially, but trying to find new voices. And I think that's very positive. I think Joe wrote a really important piece, which I vote the hearings in Congress, if they could get a little more attention, they are, um, it's malpractice. They bring on the same people and I'm, you know, fine if it's representative, but it's neither representative of diversity of anything. I mean, the views are the same. And I think that's an important place where those who care about a different foreign policy at least be heard. It'll be on the record, you know. Um, and then, you know, I agree about new voices, new voices. Um, and uh, the bases are a given. I mean, there are 800 bringing the world and that's part of the triumph, you know, sort of the triumphalism that we can be everywhere and at once in a sense. So I think there's, um, there's a lot to be, a lot to be done. I will say that Quincy, which Joe is part of, has, bec has been very successful in the first year of at least a different kind of transpartisan realist approach. And the realist approach, I think, sadly, has been maligned for years because it's been associated with Henry Kissinger, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think there is a realism that is a moral realism, that is a realism that is about humility and not triumphalism, is about democracy. And I think it has real potential and uh, it should be brought into the administration. And I don't think anyone from Quincy has really been, there was reach out, but then it didn't happen. That's right. So there's this theme that we keep hearing about, um, about making links and building coalitions and being more inclusive and drawing, you know, the, the, the obvious connection that to pay for things like climate and these other things that we care about for hospital beds, for ventilators, for masks, that we need to cut the defense that we, budget. That we need. So, so I think that- So I think that-, that I hear an echo. I hear an echo. Um, Christine, um, Christine, did you wanna to add to this? Yes, because um, it's been interesting because for so long, you know, as a peace activist, I've talked about the, um, you know, that when we spend um, and when we invest in preparation for war or, or weapons of mass destruction, we divest from our communities at home. But I think in this um, in this moment for Asian American communities, it really hits home about what hawkish U.S. foreign policy does. And I think we're seeing that in the wake of the rising anti-Asian violence where China uh, is being blamed for everything from, from, the, from the COVID to uh, loss of jobs, to, uh, to everything. And um, that is really dangerous where we have seen, um, let me just grab my figures, um, 3,800 3, hate incidents reported against Asian Americans in the last year, and almost 70% were directed at women. And, you know, people tend to think, well, it started with Trump. Well, I mean, it started, as we know, like way, way before then. And I think it's really important to put this in a really long historic context because the 20th century wars that the US waged against Japan, North Korea, China, Vietnam, Laos, and all the other covert wars that killed and displaced millions, triggered violence against Asian Americans at home. Um, during World War II, the US government deemed Japanese Americans a national security threat and forced 120,000 of them into concentration camps, later dropping bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, incinerating 200,000 Japanese lives and Koreans as well, because they were under um, US or China, Japanese 
imperial occupation. Um, when China entered the Korean War in 1950, Chinese Americans faced anti-communist McCarthyist attacks that made their communities vulnerable to violence. And so today the anti-China rhetoric is adversely impacting all Asians in the US because most Americans view Asians as a monolithic group. They don't know the difference between Koreans, Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese. Um, we saw this in 1982 during the US trade wars with Japan when two Detroit auto workers, white auto workers uh, killed Vincent Chin. Um, they thought he was Japanese and he they beat him to death. And so my, my friend, Terry Park, who was a co-author with the in the in the nation piece that Katrina invited us to write about, you know, anti-Asian violence has roots in US empire. He says we are constantly seen as perpetual foreigners, as never quite belonging to the US, as always being suspicious, and that bullseye gets larger when hawkish rhetoric ensues by US administrations. And, you know, I mean, just to bring home the point about um like what is driving this? And I think about um, what is that guy, Rob Rob Whitman from Virginia, the Republican? Is that his name, Joe? Anyway, he um, in response to um, cutting the Pentagon budget, he like tweeted about how China China is like you know is the death and destruction of the United States. Well, he is the largest recipient in Congress of arms manufacturers, and so we have to like call out what is which is, you know, and, and my colleague attended this CSIS like thing about um, the Pentagon budget. And they were saying like, yeah, we need to maintain this, um, you know, vilification of China and Russia and North Korea because, and Iran, because um, there is growing calls for cutting the Pentagon budget and we need to maintain that stance. And so I just think we, you know, we need more of these kinds of webinars. We need to have more of these kinds of critical conversations because it's not just about how the U.S. is as a global player and um, and reorienting our uh, relationship with the rest of the world away from domination and control towards peaceful coexistence and cooperation. But it's about the things that we want to achieve in this country. Do we want um, a, a radical transformation of our economy away from this militarized dependence um, to fossil fuels and things that are continuing to contribute to climate change and our death and destruction, or do we want to build a different kind of society? And I think this is the key issue. How are we going to shift US foreign policy away from endless wars? I just think it's a no brainer and we definitely need domestic movements, Black Lives Matter, uh, migrant rights and justice, economic justice, we all need to come together to really put our political will together to make this radical shift happen. Christine, that was amazing. I, I, and I just, you've brought us into the next question, next couple of questions actually, which is the human cost of US militarization and a militarized foreign policy and the legacy that is exists in your in in the in the Asian community, and we're seeing in the anti Asian violence, and you've connected it with what's going on in our country. So I just would invite um, Joe and Katrina to add to anything that Christine has just said. And Christine, if you want to say more about the human costs, um, I know this is something that you spend a lot of your time on. So you're welcome to continue with that, and we can come back to Katrina and Joe after you if you have more to say. Well, I mean, thank you so much, Cynthia. I feel like um, the human costs, like when we talk about North Korea and all we see in the media is North Korea, like goose stepping and its missile and nuclear weapons. It's like, it totally invisibilizes what is taking place right now, which is like North Korean people are suffering. US sanctions have hit hardest, the most vulnerable the women, the children, the elderly, the disabled. Uh, we really need to look at that. And you know, there are millions of families that are still divided by the world's most militarized border. So there are massive consequences of this unresolved war on people's lives. Um, but I, I, you know, it's like when we look ag again to the point about the U.S. bases, like, and the way that they're portrayed as being benign. I mean, these are places that are um, sites of violence before a war takes place, right? And so it's like, I think about the sites of resistance in South Korea against the US bases, whether it's on Jeju Island, where the US and South Korea built a naval base 
to project power against China. That was also like um, the site of UNESCO World Heritage Sites and uh, biosphere reserves. I mean, this is like endangered species, like a beautiful, like contiguous lava rock where like women sea divers still forage for seafood. And we've built a military base there. And I just think, you know, when we talk about security, like who are we talking about? Are we about trying to maintain the livelihoods of farmers, of fisher folks, of protecting, um, you know, those kinds of livelihoods? I just think we have to really look at, and I really need the environmental movement to get involved in this because this is not just like about the peace movement. This is about all of our future. And we have to make those interconnections. So that's that's all I have to say. Thanks, Cynthia. Thank you. Very passionate, very touched. Joe and Katrina, would you like to add anything about the human cost? Let me just pick up on just one of the many beautiful threads that's that uh, we just heard from Christine, and it's this racial component. We, we can't ignore this. When, when you look at who the United States identifies as its enemies, there's a heavy racial bias there. You know, who are we killing? Who are we fighting? Who, who are we worried about? Iraqis, Afghan, Iran, Koreans, Chinese now. And the more, and as you see this anti-China hysteria start to ramp up in the United States, it increasingly takes a, a racial characterization the, the graphics that you see. It, it's very reminiscent of the red menace from the, from the 50s, this, this red tide coming out with talon claws to seize Taiwan in some graphics, for example. This, this exaggeration of, this, of the Chinese threat. Remember, by the way, we're talking about the military, US military capabilities being able to contain China off the coast of China. We're not talking about defending California or Long Island. We're talking about US military maintaining dominance in the South China Sea, their sea, okay? And as you see this, you're gonna see exactly what Christine points to. This is gonna have domestic consequences here for anybody who looks remotely ch Chinese. So we have to, there's an increasing awareness in the United States about the systemic racism that, that characterizes our history. And, but we haven't really brought that into our analysis of national security. It's, it's, it's been over here someplace. Well, that's the kind of interrelationships and those kinds of connections we have to make. And that will help in building the kind of broad coalitions that Cynthia referred to. I mean, uh, Christine referred to. Uh, I was, um, there's a lot of praise of the Roosevelt era, but there are also unspeakable areas. And the Roosevelt Institute, which I've been involved with for a decade or more does a Four Freedoms Award. And this year, the overall Four Freedoms is going to the Korematsu family, which I think is um, justice denied, justice late. Um, I was gonna say, in, it's not racial, but it is a phobia. Um, I think Hillary Clinton's election uh, defeat as the establishment candidate, she was the establishment candidate and she was a Clinton, um, was such a body blow to the establishment of this country was such a trauma that people sought answers in easier ways than looking at our own country and trying to understand how a Donald Trump, I mean, did he really win, but was elected. And I think in the search for a scapegoat, Russia emerged. Now, I'm no brief for Vladimir Putin, but it extended beyond Putin. It became a Russophobia. Uh, it became a demonization of Russia. It became a journalism that treated Russia as Putin without fully understanding its politics. It became a rehash in a way of, Joe was saying the red menace of um, not only skepticism, but stigmatizing those who raised questions that were skeptical of the prevailing Russia gate narrative. And Rachel Maddow, you know, every night, it was, it's pretty, it was pretty intense. Now a lot of the Russia gate narrative has fallen apart. The foundational document, the Steele dossier has been debunked, et cetera. But it's not healthy for our country in a sense to have for a few years ignored some of the root causes of our own problems. Why we don't have clean water. <laughs> Why there, were, there weren't Iranians and Russians and Chinese running around the floor of the uh, Congress June 6th, uh, January 6th, last I checked. I mean, there are pathologies that are 
uniquely American, that were ignored or put aside. It's easier to blame others. Um, so I think we're at a moment now, I hope beyond that, where we can take a measure of our own country and speak to people, hear people, listen to people, which is not, as Joe said at the beginning, one of the reasons it seems to me that we need to open up to new groups is that for so often the nuclear field, which is a broader than nuclear, was you know treated the acronyms. You know, the acronyms were designed in a sense to make it a Mandarin's community where people couldn't fully understand or the old white men, you know, to de democratize that community to bring in allies and to speak more clearly and to bring home the human costs. I think it's critical to raising awareness. I was uh, told Cynthia the other day, there is a documentary that's coming. Um, well, first of all, how do we get a million people back in Central Park as we did June, 1982? But there's a documentary that's coming called TV Event and it's about the making and showing of the day after. If you remember, it was 100 million people viewed three hour ABC film, which had resonance. It's not, we shouldn't go back, but it's still a reminder of the power of a culture to awake people. I don't know, there's a coarsening in some ways of our culture, so it might be tougher. But anyway, I, look, I think it's coming out and uh, it, it'll be interesting to see the reaction. Thank you, Katrina. You've, you and everyone has raised this issue of dehumanization and, and creating an enemy as, as sort of at the root of how we continue and perpetuate the mess that we're in with this foreign policy and really needing to shift that by forging these connections and um, being more inclusive in, in everything from national security to all the movements that really share um, a, hum a humane and humanistic um, idea of moving forward. So um, as, we, as we're going to be moving towards the closing, I'd like to really hear um, some recommendations that each of you can make to the audience that we have with us today about what individuals here can do specifically to make a difference, some concrete steps. Are there specific legislative initiatives that you think are important for people to know about? Um, you know, what, what are the opportunities generally for civic engagement, but specifically, um, do you have some recommendations of places that people can go to engage or things they can do or congressional um, representatives that they should be following? Uh, I think it'd be really important for people to hear some specific concrete steps that they can take as they leave today even. What, what could they do today? So um, uh, I'd like to start with you, maybe Katrina, I know we just ended with you, but are you... Ah. Are you or yeah, sure. Um, the other night at Plushers, I spoke about the need for agency, for people to believe they could make a difference in what is often an opaque. But you know more about this, Cynthia, but there is, there, you're, globally, I think there's more activity around the nuclear issue, but there's ICANN, the International Committee uh, for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons. Beatrice Finn, its head, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. The, you know, you should follow and push your country to join the, uh, what is it, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which has come into effect January of 2012. Yep. Uh, don't bank on the bomb. It's similar to fossil fuel divestment campaigns. Look that up and it's traveling around cities, countries. Um, speak to your local representative, even if it's a city council because the Iran I remember around the Iran nuclear issue, there, was, there were local resolutions. New York City, by the way, has a local resolution on don't bank on the bomb, which is kind of stalled and it should be brought up. The Progressive Caucus, uh, Pramila Jayapal, someone you've heard, probably heard of, 100 strong, does have good people, like Ro Khanna, who's passed legislation, or yeah, recently, with I think Markey on fund, COVID vaccinations, not ICBMs, he's worth being in touch with. And Mark Pocan is head of the new defense budget, uh, cut the defense budget with Barbara Lee, a stalwart in the peace community. So those are a few ideas, um, but always, you know, your engagement in your community, write a letter, Did you know, you could do a Facebook group, you could do, write a letter to the community paper, the regional papers are struggling. Um, Think of open letters around times of opportunity. There's much more, 
uh, but I do think just engagement and some intensity would be of real value. Thank you, Katrina. I've just put a number of those efforts um, into the chat for people who are interested in learning more. That was really great to give those specific um, steps and the attention to the congressional representatives who are really introducing legislation that can make a difference. They need to be supported. So um, please, everyone, think about this. Okay, um, Joe, let's come to you yes. next. I'm very glad you had Katrina go first because she just <laughs> laid it out and put a number of specifics. So, that, so my my first answer is ditto. You know, <laughs> what, you, what you said. So do do that. And so when you think about this, what you really want to do is just show up. You know, it is so important to just show up someplace in some way. You know, go go read the nation. You know, go to uh, responsible statecraft, the Quincy Institute to blog, read what, what people are saying. Go check out the Progressive Caucus. Katrina's right. Th that is a growing caucus. There are more progressives now rising in influence and, and follow them, follow what they're doing because they're doing what we say. They want to cut the military budget. They want to end the forever wars. They want to shrink the footprint of the American empire. You know, and, and they want to divert resources away from foreign wars and towards domestic needs. They want to do all that. So show up and show up for them. If there's particular ones that you like, give them money, donate to them, follow them. And then here's the second part is what you do in general is don't just show up, step up, okay? So if, if you give what you can, do you have time? Give it to uh, a, a, an NGO, a campaign, some of the ones you suggested, give it to a candidate, give it to plowshares. Uh, plowshares is a sort of a, it's your mutual fund for peace and security. You don't know which of the dozens of groups to support. So give it to go to plowshares.org and give a small contribution that you know will be will find its way to some of the best people with the, the best ideas, uh, like Christine, you know, and, and women crossing DMZ who is supported, or give directly to Christine, you know. So show up, step up, and just stay engaged. Because this is we are on the winning side here. We are gaining momentum. The, the Biden administration is lagging behind, but, the, but we can push them, we can get them, we can shape the, the administration's policy, we can change US national security policy to be more diver diverse, to be a better policy, to be a cheaper policy that can secure the interests for our country for generations to come. We can do this, it just takes all of us to do it. Love that optimism. Love that call to action. Really, really inspiring. Thank you, Joe. Christine, we come to you. Well, I would say ditto and ditto to Katrina and Joe. Um, I mean, I guess my kind of closing remarks is that we can do it. People power really makes a difference. And I think the case study of Women Cross DMZ and our Korea Peace Now campaign is real testimony to that. Um, we know that when women are involved in peace processes, it actually leads to a peace agreement. But we also know, and uh, I often use a quote from Joe Cirincioni about how women cross DMZ um, brought the issue of a peace agreement to the front of mind, away from the back burner of, of US foreign policy. And you know that's what women's groups do. We kind of create the political will. We open the political space. So whatever your issue is, whatever you're concerned about, Palestine, Iran, North Korea, Cuba, um, I think that, you know, get involved, get connected. Um, you know, the Korea Peace Now grassroots network that Women Cross DMZ established, we now have like 12 chapters all around the country. We have hundreds of people that are Korean Americans, that are multi-generational veterans, um, people that are involved in humanitarian aid, people that served in uh, the U.S. military in South Korea that are involved in this movement together. And, you know, we have a virtual advocacy week coming up in July you know, if you want to get involved, sign up with us, koreapeacenow.org. Um, we would love for you to be involved in the process of democratizing U.S. foreign policy. And, uh, you know, if we don't do it, how are we possibly going to build a formidable anti-war and peace movement that could actually 
transform the Pentagon budget. And I think Joe is right. We are on the winning side of history. And as Katrina said, the pandemic has created an opening. We cannot carry the baggage of the past into the future. We have to abandon those failed policies, that broken way of thinking. And I think this is a really critical area that could transform um, the world and transform, I mean, the US military is one of the worst climate polluters, you know, US and China, like that's not the future that we want. And so what is the future? Let's not get caught in the great power competition. What is the future that is like indigenous, that is women, that is people led, that offers a different hope for my daughter and, you know, future generations to come. But if we don't get involved and get activated and get educated, then that that is futile. And so that, that is my call to everybody. Love it. All of you have been so amazing. And, you know, you've really reiterated that we are on the winning side of history. We can do this. And if not us, who, you know, it's like, yeah. it, this is the moment for us all to step up and show up. And so um, I want to just also say that uh, Christine is going to be a guest at Women Transforming Our Nuclear Legacy that we're on 21st of June. And um, Rick, I sent stuff for you to put in the chat if you're able to do that for anyone who wants to learn more and learn more about the women's movement or other movement women involved in that movement with us on the 21st in a webinar and would love to have you join us for that. Um, it's, it's a really, really important movement as Christine has outlined and also for me, as I said earlier, as I started, it's been a real inspiration to me as a woman in this work, um, building a movement with Russian women, working with Katrina on that and, and uh, with all women. So Christine is actually on the ground doing it and is actually you know, living and breathing democratizing foreign policy. And if she can do it, we all can do it. And that's everyone's call to action here. So thank you so much you all thank and you. i know we're um, we're out of time jim i know you're going to be coming back but you all have been amazing this has been a real gift and blessing so deep bows to all of you thank you thank you thank you uh, uh cynthia and joe uh katrina and christine and i, I could just say ditto 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 <laughs> <laughs> and ditto ditto again uh you know and i think um, one of the, the things that I would just simply add very, very quickly that is, is key, and I say this as an educator, is that in order to really show up and step up the way Joe and uh, Katrina and Cynthia and Christine are not only calling for, but exemplifying, because they're working on this uh, stuff 24-7, 365, it's so important to educate ourselves. Uh, because it's the truth that that sets one free. And um, as an American citizen, I actually wrote a whole book just to educate myself called America is Empire. Uh, my people first came to uh, North America in 1686. So uh, my lineage, my, my family has lived American history since before the United States was the United States. And it's, it's worth just noting that the United States has been almost unique, uh, maybe with the parallel with ancient Rome, in its foundational mission and vision of world conquest. And it's worth noting that uh, every president has engaged in foreign wars of one kind or another. I mean, you know, Thomas Jefferson, the second president, while we were still a small fledgling nation was sending ships to the Mediterranean Sea to combat the Barbary pirates. It's worth noting that President Monroe, the fifth president, again, while America was just small little nation on the Eastern seaboard of North America, enunciated the Monroe Doctrine probably the greatest act of chutzpah maybe in diplomatic history, that the United States was considering the entire Western hemisphere to be in the domain of influence of the United States. 
And uh, the rest of the world acknowledged that by and large. Uh, President Lincoln, while we were fighting the Civil War, was sending warships to Japan to force them to trade. So part of the, the, the intractability that we need to kind of underscore at this moment is that the very genetic identity of the United States uh, now exemplified by 800 bases all over the world and the consolidation of warfare capacities in space uh, is a mentality of dominance. It's not something that arose just simply because we won the Second World War. It's something that was born with us, in us, like Rome. Rome was born in the, in the, in the ninth century BC with a vision, with prophetic vision of conquering the known world. And that incubated itself in that public political social consciousness. And uh, the rest, as they say, was history. And so we're, we're at this moment, I would, I would say, where the United States is beginning its imperial decline. That's another aspect, I think, that is worth, worth noting. And at that moment of imperial decline, it's both weaker, but it's more, more dangerous. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's within this complexity of, of, uh, of imperial rise and fall so that, that, so that if we understand that, um, we're better able to show up and step up in ways like an acupuncture uh, treatment that can actually make the difference that we need to make in order to save this nation uh, and the world from a catastrophe that, as uh, Bill Perry is, is telling all of us, is more dangerous now than it's ever been. So it's a sobering, sobering moment uh, fraught with hope because there's more and more people getting engaged, but the complexities are, are daunting as we, as we consider you know, what uh, President Biden is really up to on his trip to Europe uh, that he, he began this day. Uh, but Cynthia, uh, thank you once again. My God, you are so extraordinary uh, in your capacity to convene and Katrina, Christine, Joe. Um, I salute all of you for what you're doing. Uh, it's, 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 it's powerfully important for us to take in everything that you've shared with us uh, uh, today. Uh, so thank you. And thank then you. tomorrow, everyone, we're going to dive into the issue of the mental health dimensions of the pandemic. As you all know, lockdown for a year, social distancing uh, for a very long time is, is having a deleterious effect on the mental health of people all over the world. Uh, so tomorrow, we're going to delve into that particular aspect of uh, uh, public consciousness. Uh, and I also want to just close by saying today in a, uh, uh, 30 minutes, we're launching Kate Rayworth's course on uh, the fundamentals of donut economics. We have uh, over 300 people from 42 countries that have signed up for the course. It's the largest course in the history of Ubiquity University. And uh, so uh, we uh, just wanted to celebrate that, that moment of uh, uh, solidarity uh, and strategic partnership uh, with Kate's course coming up in just a few minutes. So thank you, everyone. Uh, you're welcome to the after session chat. You'll see the link uh, in the chat box. And we look forward to uh, continuing the conversation there. Bye for now. See you tomorrow.